While all these events were occurring, I was laboring at the oar without any hope of freedom. At least I had no hope of obtaining it by ransom, for I was firmly resolved not to write to my father. At length the Galetta fell, and the fort fell, before which places there were seventy-five thousand regular Turkish soldiers, and more than four hundred thousand Moors and Arabs from all parts. The first to fall was the Galetta, until then reckoned impregnable, and it fell, not by any fault of its defenders, who did all that they could and should have done, but because experience. It was a common opinion that our men should not have shut themselves up in the Galetta, but should have waited in the other. The fort also fell, but the Turks had to win it inch by inch, for the soldiers who defended it fought so gallantly and stoutly, but that the number of the enemy killed in twenty-two general assaults, of three hundred that remained alive not one was taken unwounded, a clear and manifest proof of their gallantry and resolution, and how sturdily they had defended themselves and held their post. A small fort or tower which was in the middle of the lagoon under the command of Don Juan Zenogura, a Valencian gentleman and a famous soldier, capitulated upon terms. They took prisoner Don Pedro Portocarro, commandant of the Galetta, who had done all in his power to defend his fortress, and took the loss of it so much to heart that he died of grief on the way to... They also took the commandant of the fort, Gabriel Serbellan by name, a Milanese gentleman, a great engineer, and a very brave soldier. In these two fortresses perished many persons of note, among whom was Pagano Doria, knight of the Order of St. John, a man of generous disposition, as was shown by his extreme liberality to his brother, the famous John Andre Doria, and what made his death the more sad. These Arabs cut off his head and carried it to the commander of the Turkish fleet, who proved on them the truth of our Castilian proverb, that though the treason may please, the traitor is hated. 39. Cheek 370 Wonk. Full size among the Christians who were taken in the fort was one named Don Pedro de Aguilar, a native of some place. I say so because his fate brought him to my galley and to my bench, and made him a slave to the same master. And before we left the port this gentleman composed two sonnets by way of epitaph. The instant the captive mentioned the name of de Don Pedro de Aguilar, in which the story of the captive is continued. 48. 130. Wonk. Full-size sonnet blessed souls, that from this mortal husk set free, in guerdon of grave deeds beatified. Above this low, it was the ebbing life-blood first that failed the weary arms. The stout hearts never quailed. Though vanquished, yet ye earned the victor's crown. Though mourned, Yet still triumphant was your fall, for there ye won, between the sword and wall, in heaven glory and on earth. Well then, that on the fort said the gentleman, if my memory serves me, goes thus, sun it up from this wasted soil, this shattered shell, whose walls and towers, the onslaught of the foemen to repel by might of arm all vainly did they try, and when at length t'was left them but to die, wearied and few the last defenders fell. And this same arid soil hath ever been a haunt of countless mournful memories, as well in our day as in days of yore. But never yet to heaven it sent, I ween, from its hard bosom purer souls than these, or braver bodies on its surface bore. The sonnets were not disliked, and the cap. Finally the fleet returned victorious and triumphant to Constantinople, and a few months later died my master, El Achali otherwise Achelli Fartax, which means this scabby one rode at the oar as a slave of the Grand Signors for fourteen years, and when over thirty-four years of age, in resentment at having been struck by a Turk while at the oar, he was a Calabrian by birth, and a worthy man morally, and he treated his slaves with great humanity. He had three thousand of them, and after his death they were divided, as he directed by his will between the Grand Signor, who is heir of all who die and shares with the children of... I fell to the lot of a Venetian renegade who, 
when a cabin boy on board a ship had been taken by a chally and was so much beloved by him that he became one of his most favored youths. He came to be the most cruel renegade I ever saw. His name was Hassanaga, and he grew very rich and became king of Algiers. With him I went there from Constantinople, rather glad to be so near Spain, not that I intended to write to any one about my own, but other than in this way I lived on immured in a building or prison called by the Turks a Bano in which they confine the Christian captives, as well those that are the kings as those belonging to private individuals. To these Banos, as I have said, some private individuals of the town are in the habit of bringing their captives, especially when they are to be ransomed, because there they can keep them in safety and comfort. The king's captives also, that are on ransom, do not go out to work with the rest of the crew, unless when their ransom is delayed for them, to make them right for it more pressingly, they compel. I, however, was one of those on ransom, for when it was discovered that I was a captain, although I declared my scanty means and want of fortune, nothing could dissuade them from including me. They put a chain on me, more as a mark of this than to keep me safe and so I passed my life in that banner with several other gentlemen and persons of quality marked out as held to ransom. Every day he hanged a man, impaled one, cut off the ears of another, and all with so little provocation, or so entirely without any, that the Turks The only one that fared at all well with him was a Spanish soldier, something de savagedra by name, to whom he never gave a blow himself, or ordered a blow to be given, to go on with my story. The courtyard of our prison was overlooked by the windows of the house belonging to a wealthy moor of high position, and these, as is usual in Moorish houses, were It so happened, then, that as I was one day on the terrace of our prison with three other comrades, trying to pass away the time how far we could leap with our chains, we watched it, and one of those who were with me went and stood under the reed to see whether they would let it drop, or what they would do, but as he did so the reed was raised and moved from side to side, as the Christian came back, and it was again lowered, making the same movements as before. Another of my comrades went, and with him the same happened as with the first, and then the third went forward, but with the same result as the first and second. Seeing this I did not like not to try my luck, and as soon as I came under the reed it was dropped and fell inside the banno at my feet. I hastened to untie the cloth, in which I perceived a knot, and in this were ten cianis, which are coins of base gold, current among the moors, and each worth ten reels of it. It is needless to say I rejoiced over this godsend, and my joy is not less than my wonder as I strove to imagine how this good fortune could have come to us, but to me specially. For the I took my welcome money, broke the reed, and returned to the terrace, and looking up at the window, I saw a very white hand put out that opened and shut very quickly. From this we gathered or fancied that it must be some woman living in that house that had done us this kindness, and to show that we were grateful for it, we made salams after the fashion of the moors bowing the head. Shortly afterwards, at the same window, a small cross made of reeds was put out and immediately withdrawn. This sign led us to believe that some Christian woman was a captive in the house, and that it was she who had been so good to us. But the whiteness of the hand and the bracelets we had perceived made us dismiss that idea. In all our conjectures, we were wide of the truth. So from that time forward our sole occupation was watching and gazing at the window where the cross had appeared to do. But when we least thought it was going to rain any more seeness from that quarter, we saw the reed suddenly appear with another cloth tied in a larger knot attached to it, and this at a time when, 42, 288, full size we made trial as before, each of the same three going forward before I did but the reed was delivered to none but me, and I, I untied the knot and I found forty Spanish gold crowns with a paper written in Arabic, and at the end of the writing there was a large cross drawn. I kissed the cross, took the crowns and returned to the terrace, and we all made our salams. Again the hand appeared, I made signs that I would read the paper, 
and then the window. We were all puzzled, though filled with joy at what had taken place. And as none of us understood Arabic, great was our curiosity to know what the paper contained, and still greater the difficulty. At last I resolved to confide in a renegade, a native of Mercia, who professed a very great friendship for me, and had given pledges that bound him to keep any secret I might entrust to him. Some obtained these testimonials with good intentions. Others put them to a cunning use. For when they go to pillage on Christian territory, if they chance to be cast away or taken prisoner, in this way they escape the consequences of the first outburst and make their peace with the church before it does them any harm. And then when they have the chance they return to Barbary to become what they were before. Others, however, there are who procure these papers and make use of them honestly and remain on Christian soil. This friend of mine, then, was one of these renegades that I have described. He had certificates from all our comrades, in which we testified in his favor as strongly as we could. I knew that he understood Arabic very well, and could not only speak but also write it. But before I disclosed the whole matter to him, I asked him to read for me this paper which he opened it and remained some time examining it and muttering to himself as he translated it. I asked him if he understood it, and he told me he did perfectly well, and that if I wished him to tell me its meaning word for word, I must give him pen and ink that he might do it more satisfactorily. We at once gave him what he required, and he set about translating it bit by bit, and when he had done he said, All that is here in Spanish is what the Moorish paper contains, and you must the Christian died, and I know that she did not go to the fire, but to a laugh, because since then I have seen her twice. And she told me to go to the land of the Christians to see Lilla Marian, who I know not how to go. I have seen many Christians, but except thyself none has seemed to me to be a gentleman. I am young and beautiful, and have plenty of money to take with me. See if thou canst contrive how we may go and if thou wilt thou shalt be my husband there, and if thou wilt not it will not distress me, for Lella Marian will find me someone to marry me. I myself have written this. Have a care to whom thou givest it to read. Trust no more, for they are all perfidious. I am greatly troubled on this account, for I would not have thee confide in any one, because if my father knew it he would at once fling me down a well and cover me with stones. I will put a thread to the reed, tie the answer to it, and if thou hast no one to write for thee in Arabic, tell it to me by signs, for Lella Marian will make me understand thee. She and Allah. The renegade said this with so many tears and such signs of repentance that with one consent we all agreed to tell him the whole truth of the matter, and so we gave him a full account of all. We pointed out to him the window at which the reed appeared, and he by that means took note of the house, and resolved to ascertain with particular care who lived in it. We agreed also that it would be advisable to answer the Moorish lady's letter, and the renegade without a moment's delay took down the words I dictated to him, which were exactly what I shall tell you for nothing of this, then, was the answer returned to the Moorish lady. The true Allah protect thee, lady, and that blessed Marian who is the true mother of God, and who has put it into thy Entreat her that she be pleased to show thee how thou canst execute the command she gives thee, for she will, such is her goodness. On my own part, and on that of all these Christians who are with me, I promise to do all that we can for thee even to death. Fail not to write to me and inform me what thou dost mean to do, and I will always answer thee. For the great Allah has given us a Christian captive who can speak and write thy language well, as to what thou sayest, that if thou dost reach the land of the Christians thou wilt be my wife, I give thee my promise upon it as a good Christian. And know that the Allah and Marie and his mother watch over thee, my lady, the paper being written and folded, I waited two days until the banner was empty as before, and immediately repaired to the usual walk. As soon as I saw it, although I could not distinguish who put it out, I showed the paper as a sign to attach the thread, 
but it was already fixed to the reed, and to it I tied the paper. It was dropped, and I picked it up, and found in the cloth, in gold and silver coins of all sorts, more than fifty crowns, which fifty times more strengthened our joy in that very night our renegade returned and said he had learned that the more we had been told of lived in that house, that his name was Haja Marato, that he was enormously rich, that he had won only. We immediately took counsel with the renegade as to what means would have to be adopted in order to carry off the Moorish lady and bring us all to Christian territory. And in the end it was agreed that for the present, when we had decided upon this, the renegade told us not to be uneasy for he would lose his life or restore us to liberty. For four days the banner was filled with people, for which reason the reed delayed its appearance for four days, but at the end of that time, when the banner was, as it generally was, empty, reed and cloth came down to me, and I found another paper and a hundred crowns in gold, without any other coin. The renegade was present, and in our cell we gave him the paper to read, which was to this effect. I cannot think of a plan, center for our going to Spain, nor have all that can be done is for me to give you plenty of money and gold from this window. With it ransom yourself and your friends, and let one of you go to the land of the Christians, and there buy a vessel and come back for the others, and he will find me in my father's garden. You can carry me away from there by night without any danger, and bring me to the vessel, and remember thou art to be my husband, else I will pray to Marine to punish thee. If thou canst not trust any one to go for the vessel, ransom thyself and do thou go, for I know thou wilt return more surely than any other, as thou art a gentleman and a Christian. Endeavor to make thyself acquainted with the garden, and when I see thee walking yonder I shall know that the banno is empty and I will give thee abundance of money. Allah protect thee, sinner. These were the words and contents of the second paper, and on hearing them, each declared himself willing to be the ransomed one, and, pro and to prove the truth of what he said, he told us briefly what had happened to a certain Christian gentleman almost at that very time, the strangest case that had ever occurred even there, where, in short, he ended by saying that what could and ought to be done was to give the money intended for the ransom of one of us Christians to 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 so that he might with it this, however, he could get over by arranging with a Tagarin more to go shares with him in the purchase of the vessel, and in the profit on the cargo, and under cover of this he could become master of the vessel. But though to me and my comrades it had seemed a better plan to send to Majorca for the vessel, as the Moorish lady suggested, we did not dare to oppose him, fearing that if we did not do as he said, we therefore resolved to put ourselves in the hands of God and in the renegades, and at the same time an answer was given to Zoraida, telling her that we would do all she recommended for she had given as I renewed my promise to be her husband. And thus the next day that the banno chanced to be empty she at different times gave us by means of the reed and, and cloth two thousand gold crowns and a We at once gave the renegade five hundred crowns to buy the vessel, and with eight hundred I ransomed myself giving the money to a Valencian merchant who happened to be in Algiers at the time. In fact, my master was so difficult to deal with that I dared not on any account pay down the money at once. The Thursday before the Friday on which the fair Zoreda was to go to the garden, she gave us a thousand crowns more, and warned us of her departure, begging me, if I were ransomed. I answered in a few words that I would do so, and that she must remember to commend us to Lella Marie and with all the prayers the captive had taught her. This having been done, steps were taken to ransom our three comrades, so as to enable them to quit the banno, and lest, seeing me ransomed and themselves not, the Porti Chi 34, Chapter Xlai, in which the captive still continues his adventures, Porti Wage 106. Full size before fifteen days were over our renegade had already purchased an excellent two or three times he made this voyage in company with the Tegarin already mentioned. The Moors of Aragon are called Tegarins in Barbary, and those of Granada Mutagers. But in the kingdom of Fez they call the Mutagers Elches, and they are the people the king chiefly employs in 
to proceed. Every time he passed with his vessel, he anchored in a cove that was not two crossbow shots from the garden where Zoreda was waiting. And there the renegade, together, and thus he would go to Zoreda's garden and ask for fruit, which her father gave him, not knowing him. But though, as he afterwards told me, he sought to speak but for my part I should have been sorry if he had spoken to her, for perhaps it might have alarmed her to find her affairs talked of by renegades. But God, who ordered it otherwise, afforded no opportunity for our renegade's well-meant purpose. And he, seeing how safely he could go to Shershel and return, and answered, On this I spoke to twelve Spaniards, all stout rowers, and such as could most easily leave the city but it was no easy matter to find so many just then, because there were twenty ships. To these men I said nothing more than that the next Friday in the evening they were to come out stealthily one by one and hang about Hajimorito's garden, waiting for me there until I came. These directions I gave each one separately, with orders that if they saw any other Christians there they were not to say anything to them except that I had directed them to wait at that spot. This preliminary having been settled, Another still more necessary step had to be taken, which was to let Zoreda know how matters stood that she might be prepared and forewarned, so as not to be... I determined, therefore, to go to the garden and try if I could speak to her. And the day before my departure I went there under the pretense of gathering herbs. The first person I met was her father, who addressed me in the language that all over Barbary, and even in Constantinople, is the medium between captives and moors. In this sort of language, I say, he asked me what I wanted in his garden, and to whom I belonged. I replied that I was a slave of the Arnot Mamie, for I knew as a certainty that he was a very great friend of his, and that I wanted some herbs to make a salad. He asked me then whether I were on ransom or not, and what my master demanded for me. While these questions and answers were proceeding, the fair Zoreda, who had already perceived me some time before, came out of the house in the garden, and as Moorish women are by no means particular, it would be beyond my power now to describe to you the great beauty, the high-bred air, the brilliant attire of my beloved Zoreda as she presented herself before my eyes. I will content myself with saying that more pearls hung from her fair neck, her ears, and her hair than she had hairs on her head. On her ankles, which as is customary were bare, she had car cages, for so bracelets or anklets are called in Morisco, of the purest gold, set with so many diamonds. The pearls were in profusion, and very fine, for the highest display and adornment of the Moorish women is decking themselves with rich pearls and seed pearls. And of these there are their Zoreda's father had to the reputation of possessing a great number, and the purest in all Algiers, and of possessing also more than two hundred thousand Spanish crowns. And she who is, whether thus adorned she would have been beautiful, or not, and what she must have been in her prosperity, may be imagined from the beauty remaining to her after so many hardships. For as, in a word, she presented herself before me that day attired with the utmost splendor, and supremely beautiful. At any rate, she seemed to me the most beautiful object. As she approached, her father told her in his own language that I was a captive belonging to his friend the Arnot Mammy, and that I had come for salad. She took up the conversation, and in that mixture of tongues I have spoken of, she asked me if I was a gentleman, and why I was not ransomed. I answered that I was already ransomed, and that by the price it might be seen what value my master set on me, as they had given one thousand five hundred zoltanists for me, to which she replied, Tomorrow, I think, said I, said I, for there is a vessel here from France which sails tomorrow, and I think I shall go in her. Would it not be better? So beautiful, said I, that, to describe her worthily and tell thee the truth, she is very like thee. At this her father laughed very heartily and said, By Allah, while we were still engaged in this conversation, a moor came running up, exclaiming that four Turks had leaped over the fence or wall of the garden, and were gathering the fruit though it was not yet ripe. The old man was alarmed in Zoreda too, for the moors commonly, 
and, so to speak, instinctively have a dread of the Turks, but particularly of the soldiers, who are Father Kid While pretending to look for herbs, I made the round of the garden at my ease and studied carefully all the approaches and outlets and the fastenings of the house and everything that could be taken advantage of to make forty one three hundred twenty six. Full size having done so, I went and gave an account of all that had taken place to the renegade and my comrades, and looked forward with a The time passed at length, and the appointed day we so long for arrived. And all following out the arrangement and plan which, after careful consideration and many a long discussion, the Christians who were to row were ready and in hiding in different places round about, all waiting for me, anxious and elated and eager to attack the vessel they had before their eyes. As soon then, as I and my comrades made our appearance, all those that were in hiding seeing us came and joined us. It was now the time when the city gates are shut, and there was no one to be seen in all the space outside. When we were collected together we debated whether it would be better first to go for Zoreda, or to make prisoners of the Moorish rowers who rode in the vessel. But while we were still uncertain our renegade, we told him why we hesitated, but he said it was of more importance first to secure the vessel, which could be done with the greatest ease and without any danger, and then we could go for Zoreda. We all approved of what he said, and so without further delay, guided by him we made for the vessel, and he leaping on board first, drew his cutlass and said in Morisco, this having been accomplished, and half of our party being left to keep guard over them, the rest of us again taking the renegade as our guide, hastened towards Haja Morito's garden. The lovely Zoreda was watching for us at a window, and as soon as she perceived that there were people there, she asked in a low voice if we were Nezerani, as much as to say or ask if we... I answered that we were, and begged her to come down. As soon as she recognized me she did not delay an instant but without answering a word came down immediately, opened the door and presented herself before us all, so beautiful. And the moment I saw her I took her hand and kissed it, and the renegade and my two comrades did the same, and the rest who knew nothing of the circumstances did as they saw us do, for it only... The renegade asked her in the Morisco language if her father was in the house. She replied that he was and that he was asleep. Then... It will be necessary to waken him and take him with us, said the renegade, and everything of value in this fair mansion. Nay, said she, my father must not. An I asked the renegade what had passed between them, and when he told me, I declared that nothing should be done except in accordance with the wishes of Zoreda, who now came back with a little trunk so full of... Unfortunately, her father awoke while this was going on, and hearing a noise in the garden, came to the window, and at once perceiving that all those who were there were Christians, raising up to be brief, those who had gone upstairs acted so promptly that in an instant they came down, carrying Haja Morito with his hands bound and a napkin tied over his mouth. When his daughter caught sight of him she covered her eyes so as not to see him, and her father was horror-stricken, not knowing how willingly she had placed herself in our hands but it was now most essential for us to be on the move, and carefully and quickly we regained the vessel, where those who had remained on board were waiting for us in apprehension of some mishap having befallen. It was barely two hours after night set in when we were all on board the vessel, where the cords were removed from the hands of Zoreda's father, and the napkin from his mouth. But the renegade, won he, when he saw his daughter there, began to sigh piteously and still more when he perceived that I held her closely embraced and that she lay quiet without resisting or complaining, or she finding herself now on board, and that we were about to give way with the oars. Zoreda, seeing her father there, and the other moors bound, bade the renegade ask me to do her the favor. 
The renegade repeated this to me, and I replied that I was very willing to do so. But he replied that it was not advisable, because if they were left there they would at once raise the country and start.